and Billy's one of those old school addicts. If you don't know what that is, keep coming. He's one of those old school addicts that believes in the newcomer, that believes with his humility he can get a call to share at a convention, and if a newcomer's on the other line requesting help, he's going to stay on the line with the newcomer. I'll get back to the convention later. Shows a lot of humility to put uh, principles before personalities. So um, hopefully Billy's going to tell you all about the ping pong story. And in our area, we call Billy Ping Pong Billy. OK? I was going to bring my uh, ping pong with me and try to smoke it. And for those of you who haven't heard Billy's story before, you'll know by the end of him sharing what smoking a ping pong is all about. So I just want to say, Billy, thanks to addicts like you, paved the way as my predecessor. With my nine plus years, you made it real easy for me to come through the doors of Narcotics Anonymous and stay. Thank you, God. Billy, I'm an addict. Hey, Love you, Billy. Love you too. No Red Sox. Yeah. <laughs> can still feel the energy in the room from that clean time countdown. Can you feel the energy in here? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Wow, it's powerful. And if you didn't get to stand up tonight for a day clean and you're still using, please keep coming. Please keep coming. Because I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I was still using. I couldn't put it down. I didn't know how to stay clean. So if you're in the room tonight, are you just checking this out? Stick around for a little while. And maybe you'll come to that place where you decide you want to get clean. And there's a room full of people in here that will help. You just need to pick some out. So uh, it was nice when um, Scott told me that Eddie was here and said, wow, we go to a different place in the country and run into your N.A. family. And it's really neat. You know, I mean, that's unbelievable. And um, when Scott had called me and he says, you know, the committee has decided we'd like you to come down and share your experience, strength, and hope. To me, it's always an honor and a privilege to be able to be of service to Narcotics Anonymous. And um, let, me, let me put this out here quick because you probably already know, but like Edna said, I'm from Massachusetts, so I parked the car in Harvard Yard. Yeah. So in case there's some words they'll be saying to you, what did he say? <laughs> yeah, he can translate, so. You know, but our message, you know, like, it's our message. If you remember this fellowship, it's our message. You know, that an addict, and I, and I truly believe they put the two next words in there for me. They put a comma and they put any addict, because I was looking for a way out. And I'm trying to exclude myself. They said any addict can stop using drugs, find a new way to live, I mean, uh, lose the desire to use and find a new way to live. And it doesn't matter what accent, what language, even if it's in sign language, it doesn't matter. The message is always the same. It's that message of freedom from active addiction and, and, a, and a promise of freedom, of, of, of hope. And um, I'm a little nervous, you know. <laughs> I think my, my uppers just shifted a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I, when, I, when I heard that message, my head told me, that's, that's not for me, that's for you. It's for all these other people in the room. You're like, I, I didn't think I'd ever stop using. 
Guys, so what I'd like to share tonight is my experience with our message of stopping using drugs, you know, I mean, losing desire, and you know, and, and, and find that new way to live. I mean, and that's to me is an ongoing thing. Um, because to stop and then lose the desire, that took a little while. And then that new way to live, it's just ongoing and ongoing. And the, uh, the theme for Gikna, right? See, I want to get it right, Gikna. Yeah. Yeah. Miracles happen in the seats of N.A. And um, wow. They certainly do. And I uh, do a little research. And one of the friends that I found in Narcotics Anonymous is called the Dictionary. There's a lot of words. I don't know what you were talking about when I first got here. And um, a lot of my education came from the street. So I knew a lot of street lingo, but I didn't know, really know the English language that great. So I got a dictionary kind of early in recovery. And uh, it kind of helps me from time to time. But I wanted to look up, you know, like miracles and stuff. And in, in, in the Webster Dictionary, the definition of a miracle is an effect or extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers as it is ascribed. And that means credited to. I had to look that up too. Uh, is ascribed to a supernatural cause. And to me, that's the higher power brought me here. And that's the way I'd stay a miracle, is believing in that, that higher power and that God that, that keeps me here. And what the miracle is from, is from the disease of addiction. So I looked up addiction. And in the dictionary it says, the state of being enslaved to a habit or practice or to, or to something that is psycho psychological or physically habit forming to such an extent that it's cessation, I had to look that up. Um, <laughs> cessation means a temporary stopping or a complete stopping, causes severe trauma. Wow, Woo. I need some help with that one then, don't I? <laughs> you know, in that physical part, you know, depending on what substance it is, you might have to go to a facility somewhere because there's a medical condition that they need to help you with. But sometimes you don't go to a detox and it's that psychological thing, that, that trauma in the head. And I think I needed more help with that than anything. That's where I needed the help to, to recover from. And um, so like I said, I'd like to share with you like some experiences. And um, a few years ago, I was driving through Boston and I went through this puddle. And it just reminded me of an incident that had happened like 20 years ago while I was active. And I, and I believe like all my things that happened in my life is kind of stored in my brain. They just don't, you know, come to the surface all the time. But this, this thing just, I never thought of this clean, you know, but it just reminded me of a situation. And what the situation was, I was standing on this corner in, in Massachusetts, in, in Revere, Massachusetts, and I was on that corner as sure as the lamppost was there, you know. I just stood there because I don't want to miss anything, you know. Like, someone might come by with something. There might be a scam. I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> Rain, snow, sleet. I don't want to miss anything, you know. <laughs> so this guy comes by. This guy, Joe, comes by and he says, Billy, do me a favor. Drive me into Boston. I want to get some drugs and I'll take care of you. Whoa. Well, you, when you tell me those words, you get my attention. <laughs> they weren't always true, but somebody would tell me, I'll take care of you. Okay, let's go. So I get in my uninsured, unregistered, <laughs> phony sticker, no front brakes, wonderful vehicle. <laughs> and we're on our way. And we're driving down the expressway in Boston, and it starts raining out. I don't have any windshield wipers. I have it, just that the motor doesn't work. So I grind down the window and stick my head out the window. I'm on a mission. I'm not slowing down. It's just raining. We'll put up with some rain and beating the shit out of my face. 
we drive into a certain part of Boston and there used to be these old trolley tracks there and they had dug them up and there was like ruts in the road. And it was a two-way street. It was old Washington Street in Boston and I don't know why I had to say that, but. Um, so I'm driving and a car on the other side hits a puddle and hits me right in the face. <laughs> I mean sand, mud, you know. I just wipe my face, spit out the sand and keep driving. <laughs> And I'm on a mission. I don't want to slow down for nothing. So finally we get the drugs and we're on the way back and it's just torrential downpours. And I know you know what that is. And um, I said to Joe, I said, Joe, I got to do something. And as addicts, we're very creative people. We are some creative people. So I pull over to the store and I go in the store and I come back out and I had two pieces of string. And I tied one to winch one windshield wiper and I went there. <laughs> Say pull, Joe, and he's pulling. <laughs> but I found out after several rainstorms, because I never changed the string, that the string used to break because it used to get wet. So I upgraded to shoelaces because they last long. And then I got enough shoelaces that I tied them together so they met in the middle. So when I was by myself, I could drive with my knee. You know, we learned how to do that when we were rapping, you know, rolling up. I heard a, I heard a line one time. Well, no, actually, I read this. I did, believe it was in the second step that people tend to live a life in what they believe in. I believe that that's all I deserved. I didn't believe a decent car. I didn't deserve a decent car. I was this no good piece of garbage that didn't deserve any better anyway, so you might as well live the way you live. I don't believe that today, but I did at that time. I also heard a line that, don't believe everything you think. And that's for my safety and yours. Because <laughs> I believe I didn't deserve any more. And I started to rationalize with that car saying, ah, it really doesn't rain that much in Boston anyways. Because <laughs> when I got money from whatever scam or wherever I got this money, I can tell you that one thought never entered my mind, you know, I should buy a windshield wiper motor with this money. <laughs> never crossed my mind. Because what I had was sufficient for not, it was doing the job, it was a little inconvenient, but it was okay. Because drugs was the number one priority. When money came into my hand, how much can I get? Where can I get it? How fast can I get it? That's the questions I asked. And I know from listening to a lot of people that we thought the same way. Because I want to keep it on the eye. I don't want to get into the preaching of you and you and you and you. Because I want to just keep the focus on myself and hopefully you can identify with it. And usually laughter is identification. <laughs> Are you laughing? So yeah, I, uh, I always keep that in my head that I can't believe everything I think. I can think some things, but not everything. Because the disease will lie to me. This disease tells me some crazy stuff. It tells me you're not good enough. It tells me that sometimes like, oh, if someone else was in the pain you were in, they would use too. Sometimes, I don't know why, like I'm by myself, it's like no one will know. What an insane thought that is. <laughs> I don't know. And then once I know, a lot of other people know. <laughs> but I don't think they know. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I gotta keep a check in the time. I can talk a cat off a tuna bowl, let me tell you. <laughs> Wasn't always like that.
So the way I used drugs was the first drug I used was alcohol, and every drug after that was a drug I was not going to use. <laughs> I'm on the point of you. Yeah, I may be drinking. Look at them potheads. They're some sick bastards, aren't they? <laughs> at least I'm not doing that. And then when I was drinking and smoking pot, I go, hey, look at them pillheads. Oh, they're taking that speed. They're sick people. <laughs> I'd rather put the focus on you. Let me point at you so I don't have to take a look at me, but that only worked for so long. Even in recovery, I used to do it. Let me put the focus on you. That only happens for so long and the pain gets too great. And there came a time where I didn't care how things get in my body, what they did to my body, as long as they made me feel better, so I thought. I always wanted to change the way I felt. It wasn't that I didn't want to feel, I always wanted to feel better. If I was bored, I was angry, I was whatever, I wanted to take something to feel better. Even if I was feeling good and everything's going good, I still want to take something to feel better. I didn't know you just feel the feelings for what they are. So there came a time where this wonderful government wanted my services in the army. Once they had me, they realized it was a terrible mistake. <laughs> And I ended up in Vietnam. And when I was in Vietnam, I had caught on a drug test. I studied very hard for that test, by the way. <laughs> so I'm in this detox in Vietnam, and we weren't in there to stop using and seek out spirituality and work on our anger issues. We got caught, and we're in this locked detox. So being addicts, well, I was. I don't know about the rest of the guys there, but we start talking to each other. How are we going to get high in here? Oh, my God. So one guy says, I heard you can take a Paul Mall cigarette and you crush up some aspirins and you suck the aspirins upside into the cigarette. And then you take some toothpaste and you smear it on the outside of the cigarette, let it sit out in the sun and dry, and you smoke it and you can get high. And we laughed at this guy and laughed at him, and then we proceeded to get a Paul Mall cigarette, some aspirins and some toothpaste. Somebody mentioned that something might work. I tried it, I got dizzy in a sore throat, and I go, no, nah, that's, that wasn't, not what I'm looking for, I'll tell you, but good luck. You can have mine. So I told these guys, when I was stationed in Germany, somebody told me you can get high smoking ping pong balls. I want to see how you sign that, ping pong balls. I'm just curious. So I told these guys and they said, do what you got to do, Billy. So I'm going to give it a try. So I go to this rec hall and I stole a couple of ping pong balls. I come back to the ward and I'm sitting there at night and I start smoking this ping pong ball. <laughs> and this guy looks over at me and I'm kind of gazing into the ceiling, you know, and he says, hey, I know I ragged you and called you crazy. You mind if I join you? <laughs> I said, no, sit on down, bro. <laughs> so a few minutes went by and another guy come over and, hey, I know I ragged you and called you crazy too. But you mind if I sit in with you? <laughs> No, oh, it's no problem. So the three of us sat there and smoked a couple of ping pong balls. <laughs> the next day I went to the rec hall, I stole five ping pong balls. <laughs> so I was sitting on, the, sitting on the bed that night, and you know, and next thing you know, here comes another rack, another one. By, now this time, there's eight of us in a circle. To the point where we needed to change something up, we needed to make a pipe. 
like I said, us addicts, we're creative. You know, you give us fruit and vegetables, we make pipes. You, know, you, <laughs> you give us a, a, a piece of wood and a cat, we make a pipe. You know what I mean? It, it don't matter. You give us something, we'll find a way to make something work, you know? So we make this pipe and we, you know, pass it around. Next thing you know, people, hey, you're bow guy, you took two hits, you got back in line. Whoa, whoa! <laughs> easy guy, we got something going here, take it easy. <laughs> the next day I get up real early and I stole the whole box of ping pong balls. Because <laughs> I know if I didn't, somebody else would. On the way back to the detox ward, I took two out of the box and stashed them in the sand. <laughs> I'll share with you, you ain't getting it all, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that night, we're smoking them and it came to the end and I said, that's it, God, there's no more. Three or four of them looked at me and they said, you're lying, you had to stash something somewhere. <laughs> And I said, no, that's it. I gave you what I had, man. That's it. There ain't no more. You've seen the box. <laughs> yeah. I went up. I went to the bathroom, the latrine in the army. But I went to the bathroom. I came back. And they had flipped over my mattress. <laughs> had the drawers pulled out of the little dresser I had. And kind of ransacked the area looking, you know. Dread me with violence, the whole bit, saying, give them up. I know you have to have them somewhere. And I, I convinced them that I didn't have any more. And needless to say, I smoked the last two by myself. I'd sneak off and, you know, and come back and they're looking at me, are you high? No, I'm just tired. You know? <laughs> and you know, every, every night we smoked the, the even the first night, when we sm I smoked the ping pong balls. Right after we were done, I used to get a mad headache, like there, was, like there was a spike going through my head. I could barely breathe, I had pains in my chest, and I'm basically smoking plastic, so... And what the high was, was it was the, the fumes and the plastic, and this was shutting off the oxygen to my brain, and killing brain cells. But you know, I didn't care what the consequences were. All I cared about it, it was getting, it was, it was taking me to a different place. It was changing the way I felt. And I look at that, you know, and that to me is a disease of addiction because if you take the substance of ping pong balls out of that story and insert any brand of insanity, it's the same. So you know, when we talk about drug of choice, I had drugs, I prefer it. I really prefer it some. But what it came down to, what's available, that's my choice. There was so many times I did drugs I didn't even like, but there was nothing else around. And when I did that drug, I'd be, why do this? I'll never do this again! <laughs> Two weeks later, I'll never do this again! So the drug of choice doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter how you come in here and what you're using. And somebody asked me if that was a true story. And I said, I'm not here to tell Mother Goose stories. That was just part of my insane stuff in active addiction. And we all do a lot of insane stuff. Then I met a guy and he said, aren't you the guy that smoked golf balls? <laughs> and I said, no, I never got that bad. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's funny now, but it wasn't so funny then. <laughs> it was a sad, sad place to be. Sad place to be. And finally I came to a place, and I got one of the greatest gifts that I could have ever got in my life. And it was the gift of desperation.
I was tired of having suicidal thoughts every day. I was tired of hating myself. I despised myself. I hated myself. I could no longer look in the mirror. It was just next to impossible. And if I did, I'd look and I'd call myself a lot of names. I wanted to stop robbing. Well, not robbing, because that sounds, ooh. I wanted to stop stealing from my mother. I wanted to stop stealing from my sister. I wanted to stop stealing from my nieces and nephews and anyone else that I came in contact with. But it was mostly my family. Because I knew I could, you know, kind of get in there and bullshit them. And at the end, they just couldn't take it anymore either. And that was, that's when it happened. And I just didn't want to do that anymore. I wanted to, I wanted to stop calling my daughter on a Sunday afternoon at 1 o'clock and say, I'll be there at 2. Call her up say, I'll be there at 3. Call her up and say, ah, Dad's not feeling too good. I'll see you next week. And next week would be the same story. To the point I said, you know, if I can't be a good parent, I'm not going to be one at all, which was a lie. Drugs were more important than anything else. But I used that rationality to kind of make myself feel better. Feel bad and feel better, kind of, you know. That's the things I wanted. So when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I started listening a little bit. Like I said, I came, I was still using, and someone just said to me, oh, why don't you try to come in tomorrow and not be using? And if you're still using, that's okay. Keep coming. We just hope you don't die in the process of getting here clean. Okay, that sounds pretty heavy. So I wasn't working. I was still living with my sister. I was in the process of moving out. I had my three bags of laundry, and the glad bags. My laundry was separated with dirty, dirtier, and dirtiest. <laughs> you know, you do, you do the smell, can I wear this? Oh yeah, this ain't bad, you know. So I started to come to meetings, and I'm fortunate in the area I live in that I could go to two, three meetings a day. So I'm going to these meetings, and after five or six days, these guys kept asking me every day to go out to lunch. It was a daytime meeting. Come on, Billy, come with us for lunch. And I had all the excuses the first few days, because I was horrified. How do you, I don't know how to socialize with people. I, lo I don't have any social skills. The only social skill I had is that depending on the substance I had in my body, you know, if it was coke or speed, I'd, hey, 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 you know, dominate all the conversations, you know. <laughs> so it, it depended, you know, it depended what I was on. And so not to be on anything and trying to sleep. Um, I was horrified at going, sitting down with people and trying to, you know, socialize. So every time they asked me, I'd, one particular day, I, you know, I come up with the, oh, no, I got to get back. I got to catch that. You know, 210 bus. Oh, we'll give you a ride home. Oh, I don't have any money anyway to go out to lunch. Oh, we'll buy you lunch. <laughs> oh, I got cigarettes home and, you know, I was still smoking at the time. He's, oh, we'll give you some smokes. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> they had all the yard bots and they had all the answers, you know. And these were experienced members because they did the same thing, so they knew. So anyway, I go to this restaurant and I'm sitting down and, I mean, I'm, I'm eating a bowl of soup because, you know, I... Food wasn't a big, you know, item on the agenda for the day when I was using. Like, yeah, I'm gonna eat some good food today. <laughs> so my my stomach was the size of a raisin at the time, you know. <laughs> and the people I was with, you know, they've been in recovery a while. You know, there's appetizers, mozzarella sticks, buffalo wings flying around. <laughs> yeah, I'll have another one of those. Make that two. So, so I'm sitting there, you know, it, it, it's, it was blowing my mind. I'm looking around, I'm saying, okay, I know the guys at this table, you know. I said, I need to do something for them. Because this is really cool. They don't even know me. They just know me from these meetings from the last week. And I said, you know, guys, I'm going to remember everyone sitting at this table. And when I get a job, I become employable, I get some money. 
I want to do the same for you. I want to take you out and treat you just like you treat me. Because this, this really means something to me. I said, I admit I'm horrified and it was hard for me to sit down here. I said, but I really appreciate it. And they said to me, that's a real nice gesture, but this is what we'd like to do, we'd like you to do. When you get in a position that you have some money, are you, you're able to have a vehicle, I just want to take somebody out, do it for a newcomer. He said, do it for somebody that's in the position you're in. Because, you know, we're established, we're doing okay, we're going to continue to do that for people, and we would like you to do that for them too. You know, and, it's, and he said, it's just not taking them out to eat or anything, it's, you know, just sitting beside them or just listening or whatever, he says, but that's the way it works. And I'm sitting there nodding my head, right? And I'm saying, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> that's like a concept that I couldn't understand. Saying, wait a minute, they don't want it. They, they're giving me something and they want me to give it to someone else. Because I don't know, this never happened to me on the street. Billy, here's three bags of dope. And when you get the money of the dope, give it to somebody else. <laughs> so that concept, you know, I, I know it today though. And I, um, a few days later, I'm sitting in the kitchen with my sister. I had oh, seven, eight, nine days clean. And my sister had been through a lot. I was living with her for about three years while I was active, and uh, it was nuts. So she gets up to go to the bathroom, and she takes her pocketbook. And Mr. Recovery with eight days clean gets insulted. She comes back from the bathroom and I said, sis, what are you doing? She said, what do you mean? She said, you go to the bathroom, you take your pocketbook. I get eight days clean. She says, you know, that's great. She goes, in this short period of time, I can already see it changing. It's good. I like to keep going to those meetings. Keep doing what you're doing. But I'll let you know when I can trust you. Whoa. So I realized then, not right away, I was a little that trust is something I need to earn from somebody. It's not something I can tell you. I just can't tell you and you feel it. Because trust on the street was thrown around, that word was just thrown around for thrown around. Is this good? Oh yeah, trust me. <laughs> You'll be back in a half hour. Oh yeah, trust me. You're gonna pay me when you get checked next week. Oh yeah, trust me. <laughs> so that word was just kicked around. It didn't have no value to it. It does today though. And then it came to a point where I trust myself. I know I can be trusted. So if there's still people that don't trust me, that's their process. It's no longer mine. And um, that took a long time to learn, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I love our literature. You know, there's some people in this world that's written some wonderful literature for a lot of different reasons, but I love our literature because it was written by addicts for addicts. I just love that. And um, whether I'm reading something or it's just for today, sometimes it's so scary, it's like, Jesus, how do they know? Like if someone's... <laughs> And Twilight Zone stuff, you know, like wow. But it's because it was written by an addict, for an addict, and I and I love it. And one of the things I try to like keep in mind all the time, the thing I strive for is in and it's in a paragraph and uh, it works how and why on page one twelve. It says we see that regardless of the presence or abstinence of material success in our lives, we can be content. We can be happy and fulfilled with or without money, with or without a partner, with or without the approval of others. We've begun to see that God's will for us is the ability to live with dignity, to love ourselves and others, to laugh and to find great joy and beauty in our surroundings. 
Our most heartfelt longings and dreams for our lives are coming true. These priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. They are, in fact, the very essence of God's will for us. Wow. Wow. You know, to have the presence or absence of material success. Wow. Because I was, I was in the fix-it mode once I had a job and got some money. I had that material stuff going. I, was, I didn't work in about eight years. I'm working 16 hours a day. Let me get the stuff. I got to get that stuff, man. You know, and looking to fix me with that stuff. With or without money. It's okay to be with money or without money. And that's a tough one, because financial insecurities, whoo. So to be able to live this and be with or without a partner, oh my God, you want me to be by myself? I need someone to be around to fix me. And with or without the approval with others. I used to be on a... I was like on a mission with the approval of others. And real simple stuff, because that paragraph kind of tells me like, I just want to be okay with me, no matter what. Yeah. And my approval for others is a real simple task sometimes. I'm holding the door open for someone, and they don't say thank you. Mm. You're welcome! I don't need to say that. <laughs> I'm not holding the door for your approval to tell me I'm a nice guy. I don't know what's on their mind. Hey, when I'm driving in Boston and I let someone in, go ahead, and they don't give me the old wave in the mirror. Oh. Sometimes I race up to them, hey, you're welcome! to be grateful I'm driving a registered car, an insured car, with windshield wipers. <laughs> then I heard one time that one of the defini definitions of humility is do something nice for somebody and don't tell anybody. <laughs> if I'm seeking the approval of others, that's a real tough one to do. I have four or five years clean and I'm, I find a wallet. I'm practicing spiritual principles of the honesty. I open the wallet, it's near Christmas time. I find the guy's um, address, call him on the phone. There's money in there, there's credit cards. I don't know, I had a look, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's a process. So he shows up and I give him the wallet back and he's hugging me, oh, thank you so much. It's nice to know there's people like you in the world. And I'm, oh, let me give you some, oh no, just the act of doing it. Is a reward in itself. Well, that was a lie. I go back to work, the receptionist, hey, how you doing? I, yeah, I just found the wallet. And I, I gave it back to the guy. He didn't take a reward. No. <laughs> Every co-worker I ran into. Yeah, I just found the wallet. Guy came down. I started telling people I didn't even know. Went out to lunch. Yeah, I'll have a human cheese. Yeah, by the way, I uh, found the wallet today. I gave it back. I'm an honest guy. Tell you. I just want to be okay with me. I don't want all <laughs> Amazing. But you know, it's all a process of getting better and learning. I didn't do that stuff before. You know, and to enjoy our surroundings. Seen the sunset last night. You know, no matter what it is, just say, wow, did you see that sunset? Last week in Boston, there was a double rainbow. Beautiful, you know. I was never on the street saying, yeah, can I have an eight ball? And did you catch that sunset tonight? Is that something? How about the foliage? Isn't that wonderful? 
I'll tell you. I was watching this program the other day, and this person had this, they kept this thing for a memory. It was crime scene tape. And I was thinking, when I was using, I should have had clothes made out of crime scene tape. That was a walking crime scene. Should have had a bandana, shirt, pants, underwear, socks, all crime scene tape. Because every day I was doing something, and the worst thing I was doing, I was committing a crime against myself. There was nothing nice. And I don't have to tell you that. You know that. To feel like that is, whew, not no more. I used to, I, I still have this barometer of um, seeing where my self-centeredness is. I don't do it anymore, but I... For a while I was doing this, and it was checking to see where I was at for the day. And I wasn't doing it on purpose, I just, it was just there. I'd go to a grocery store, this is in recovery, and I'd run in and I need to get three or four items. I get the three items and I go to the 12 items or less line. And I'm standing in line and I look, and the person in front of me get 14 items. I know because I've counted them. <laughs> So now the committee starts up. Oh, what are you going to shit in there? Yeah, 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 stay in line. You shouldn't be in line 14 nights, isn't it? It's 12 items or less. Signs right there. Oh my God, they're paying by check and they don't even have the checkbook up. They know they're going to pay by check. They're not even supposed to be in the. Oh my God, coupons! You've got to be kidding me. They shouldn't even be in this line. It's all about me that day. So what I needed to do is start being grateful that I drove there with my own vehicle. I had money to pay to buy some food to be able to get in that line. Because I used to use grocery stores as my personal buffet. I made sandwiches, I had dessert, something to drink, maybe some fruit, and then I left. <laughs> so I need to be grateful that I was paying for those things. Maybe the person couldn't count. It could be worse. It could be two people in front of me with seven items. I'd have to get out of there a little late. I mean, no, I just had to look at it. So now when I get in line, I start counting, I look at the ceiling and start counting the ceiling tiles. And I laugh at it now, you know, but that's where I was. For the first year in recovery, when you saw me at a meeting, you saw me at a convention, you saw me at a dance, you saw me in a coffee shop, you saw me at somebody's house, I was wearing a hat. It was 100 degrees, it was 10 degrees, it did not matter. Inside, outside, it didn't matter where it was. I was wearing a hat every single day. And the reason I wore a hat is if you knew I was bald, you wouldn't like me. Because I would say, I had no self-acceptance of who I was. And when I don't have self-acceptance of me, I'm thinking, how can you accept me this way? And when I don't accept me, I have a problem accepting you. Oh, look at that one. She's screwing him. Look at that fat bastard over there. <laughs> Oh, look at them all dressed up. Who do they think they are? <laughs> I heard when there's enemies inside, there's enemies outside. So I'm not okay in here, I'm not okay out there. And it took some work and it took a lot of courage for one day to be walking into a meeting not having a hat. And at the time I had hair down to my ass, you know, I was still letting the hippie thing go. Kind of looked like St. Uh, Anthony hippie kind of thing happening. <laughs> I 
but it took a lot of courage and it was unbelievable when I walked through the doors and people were looking at me saying, you look different. It was probably because the top of my head was so white it hadn't seen sun. <laughs> you know, when some people knew what I was doing, they said, that's all right, man. I'm glad you're doing that. And, some, you know, and I shared about that and it helped other people to kind of walk through it. And I think that's, you know, what happens in here. I don't think. I know that's what happens. We share some experience and, you know, say, wow, you know, they walked through that. Maybe I can walk through something too. You know, and I just share it with people. So now I wear a hat because I like the Red Sox. Um, I need to protect my head from frying or it gets cold in Boston or I just like some cool hats. Now it's a choice. Now it's an accessory, not a necessity. Yeah. Wow. That was big for me, you know. I, like I say, it, it was hard for me to go through that process. And what helped me with that process, and it's something I fought and I fought and I fought, was the steps. I fought the steps wholeheartedly. I didn't, I didn't sponsor anybody for the first four or five years clean because I hadn't gone through the steps. And I said, how can I sponsor somebody if I haven't been through something? It's like telling somebody, hey, it's a, it's a crazy jungle and I haven't been through it, but come on, I'll guide you, let's go. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and even when, like, when they says, uh, it suggested you have a year clean before you get involved in a relationship. Well, to me, it don't mean nothing if I haven't been doing any work that year. I needed like five years. I didn't do that. But that's what I should have done. So I'm struggling with the steps, and this friend of mine comes up to me and goes, Billy, let me tell you, I know you're struggling, but here's, here's what, what it boils down to. There's only one big step. And I said, beautiful, I found the guy that knows the shortcuts. Because <laughs> I like to do the least and get the most, you know? And I said, this is the guy I've been looking for. I said, Richie, what is it? He says, you have to go from self-centeredness to God-centeredness. I says, all right, man. I says, how do I do that? He says, do the 12 steps of not common <laughs> So I, uh, I found out there was, to me, there's three important relationships. One with a sponsor that will guide me through the steps. That's his main job for me, is to get me through them steps, guide me through the steps. Be there for me, but guide me through the steps. And I develop a better relationship with him. And as I'm being guided through the steps, I'm developing a better relationship with God. And when I'm developing a better relationship with God, I start developing a better relationship with me. Right. Now I can have relationships with other people. I didn't know what that was. I've been in relationships long after they were over. I'm still in them. <laughs> Expiration date gone. I'm still there. <laughs> I just it had a hard time letting go. Then I went to this workshop one time, it really helped me. It said, let go or be dragged. <laughs> and you know, when I was, when I started dating people in recovery, before I had got involved with the steps, so I really didn't have a clue who I was, but, you know, I wanted to be with somebody. I had a lot to offer. <laughs> <laughs> and when I met somebody, I'd introduce myself, hi, I'm Billy, you know, and yeah, maybe we can go to a movie, go to a comedy club, go dancing, whatever, you know, whatever. And I'd tell whatever, and you know, I'd be the chameleon, you know, I'd find out what music they like, so the next date I had that CD in the, you know. <laughs> and I'm driving, I can't stand this music. And she get in the car, hey, what's happening? <laughs> so 
So what I should have been saying to women when I started dating and before I got involved in the steps is, hi, my name's Billy. I'm full of fear, doubt, insecurities. I got defects up the yin-yang. I don't even have a clue what they are. I'm gonna tell you shit I really don't mean. I'm gonna tell you I want you to be just who you are, but I'll try to change you. I have trust issues. And I would like to share this with you. I don't think there would have been a second date. And I, and I used to like to be the, um, I used to like to keep this big white hoss and shining armor in the closet. Because when I saw a woman in distress, okay, here comes Billy, I'll save you, baby, come on. More baggage, the better. Throw it on the hoss, let's go. Let me take care of you, because I ain't gonna take care of me, come on. Wow. And then it was one day like, you, know, you hear the readings and all of a sudden something hit me. And it was, it was, it was kind of like, uh, like the whole fellowship was saying, Billy, you hear that phone ringing? Pick it up, it's the clue phone and say hello because you don't have a clue. <laughs> and I started to hear the words because I was in so much pain at the time, I started to hear the words of how it works. It was like the whole fellowship was talking to me, saying, Billy, you want what we have to offer? I'm going, oh yeah. <laughs> you willing to make the effort to get it? Oh yeah. <laughs> kind of willing, no, not kind of willing, willing, no, you know. And then you're ready to take certain steps. And the line that really got me was, these are the principles that made our recovery possible and they start listing the steps. So what it meant to me was, if I don't start practicing these principles, recovery is not possible for me. I can stay clean. I know what it is to be clean and be abstinent, but to recover is a whole different ball game for me. You know, and it, it involved reading. Ooh, I don't like to read. Some of these sponsors want you to write shit. <laughs> I don't like that either. There's many things in life I don't like. I don't like to do laundry, but you know, <laughs> you gotta do laundry. <laughs> so that's what really hit me, as you know, it was time to do some work. And then this friend of mine, this wonderful man, he come up and, you know, it's great, like addicts know you're suffering, uh, you know, you're stuck somewhere, and. He waited to the end of this meeting and he said, Billy, I know you, you're really having a hard time with the steps. Let's share about it, you know. And so he was one of the predecessors and he came up to me and he said, listen, let me tell you my interpretation of the steps. And he says, you know, this is the, how I look at it. And I said, sure, Ralph. And so he stayed, the meeting was over and he went up to the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous that was hanging on the wall. And he says, you know how we talk about the spiritual principles and how they're all connected to the steps. And I said, yeah. He says, well, with each step, there's, there's a lot of different spiritual principles that accompany every step. He says, but there's three of them that repeat themselves over and over and over. He says, you know how we talk about the how of the program? He says, you know how we talk about you'll be defeated in your recovery if you have an indifference or intolerance towards honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness? He says, well, let me show you. He says, in the first step, you have to look at, be honest. You have to be honest. You're powerless over this addiction, your life becomes a man's. You have to really honestly believe that and accept it. He says, it's going to take work with a sponsor to get through that. But that's where the honesty is. He says, now you need to be open-minded enough there's a power greater than yourself. man. Because people, you know, tend to like, I don't know if about that. He says, well, be open-minded enough. Because once you, win, you know, get the essence of the first step, it'll allow you to go to the second. He says, you know, it could restore you to sanity. There's, there's work to be done there. He says, now that'll let you come into willingness. 
You know, and the willingness to turn your will and your life over to this God of your understanding. I said, wow. He says, now, after the HOW, here it comes again. You have to be honest enough to take, take that personal inventory. You know, and he says, it's not just what's wrong with you, it's what's good about you, too. He goes, you know, everybody focuses on this terrible, terrible stuff. Yeah, there's stuff there. And I started looking at it, you know what I'm saying? Well, the inventory is like, I've been carrying, and even in the steps, I've been carrying this baggage around with me for so long. Let's drop it and take a look inside. I'm just tired of fucking, oh, man. And I just kept putting more in the bag and more in the bag and recovering on, man, I'm getting bogged down here. I says, then be open-minded enough to, you know, to find the exact nature of your wrongs with yourself and admit it to God and another human being, whether that be your sponsor or not. See, wow, he says, now be willing enough to get ready to let him go. That takes some willingness. Now here comes the honesty again. Be honest enough that you're not getting rid of him. God is. It's not you. You've got nothing to do with it except participating and allowing God to do it. Is then be open-minded enough to, to make that list. Don't take score. Make the list. Then be willing enough to go out there and do that. He says, and that takes courage too, but you're going to sit down with a sponsor throughout this. He says, now you're going to be honest enough to look at your day. Take that personal inventory. And when you're wrong, promptly admit it. But some days you're not going to be wrong. You don't have to admit anything. Just take the inventory, see how you did. And then be open-minded enough to improve that conscious contact. Sit down with some meditation for a little bit. Ask that prayer. And then just pray for the knowledge of God's will for you and the power to carry that out. Because you're going to get some power, but it's going to come from God now. He says, and be careful what you pray for, because you just want to pray for the, the knowledge of God's will. He goes, you pray for a car, nice brand new car, you better pray that you're okay with road rage, insurance, traffic, Flat tires, windshield wipers. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you know, and, and you get, you, the, the, uh, op, the um, spiritual awakening is going to happen. And now on the 12th, you're going to talk, you have the willingness to practice them principles in all your affairs and carry to the message to the addict that still suffers. And I said, wow, man. Because I need some st stuff like that. I need people to sit down with me and kind of explain stuff. And it helped me. You know, and I, and I still have those beliefs today from him. And I know there's other, and I, there are our spir spiritual principles to other steps, but that really, really helped me. And I, um, it was interesting, I was, I was out in Kansas last month, or a month, whatever, last month. And you never know when things are going to happen. And I'm at this convention, and it was a Saturday morning, and I said, I wanted to get some chai tea. So I'm out, I'm out there by myself. Because sometimes I, I travel with my girlfriend to this convention, but sometimes I travel by myself. Once I have God in my life, I don't travel alone anymore. There's a difference. So I travel there by myself, and I'm, I'm walking on this Saturday morning, and I, I get the tea, and I'm on my way back, and I'm looking around for stores and stuff, and you know, and, I thought maybe I'd buy my girlfriend a gift or whatever. I don't know. I'm just looking. I see these line of stores and I go in the back and I see this sign. And this sign excites me. Sale. <laughs> oh, I like sales. I go into a store and I see 50% off. I start getting a little shaky. 75% off. I'm like, whoo. Clearance. <laughs> If it's clearance, I buy shit that doesn't even fit me. <laughs> I take an 11 shoe, I'll take, a, I'll take those 10s, it's a good deal. I'll just curl my toes, right? <laughs> you know, looking to fix myself, looking for the malgasm, I call it, you know? So I see this store and I, oh, let me go in, it was a gift store, and I peek in the window and you know, they had like candles and stuff. And I said, oh, let me go in. I walk in, there's this woman behind the counter. She starts telling me about what things are on sale, 25% off. And so I'm, I'm talking to her, and the easiest thing to start a conversation with is the weather. And if you've ever been to Kansas on the highways, I was talking to Mr. Bill about this, they have these winds, straight liners, or whatever they call them, but they come straight across, and they rock and roll you. 
And I was telling her about that. I said, well, I was, I come up from Wichita and it was really windy. And she goes, oh yeah, she's a, she goes, I, we just buried my grandmother yesterday. And I said, oh, sorry to hear that. And it was crazy. And so she goes, I said, well, it's not like the weather I come from. And she goes, where are you from? I said, Massachusetts. And she goes, well, what are you doing in Hayes, Kansas? And I said, well, I'm actually, and sometimes I disclose and sometimes I don't. And it just felt okay to do it with this woman. And I says, I'm at a, a convention of uh, recovering addicts. I says, and what, she goes, well, what's that? I says, well, what we do is we celebrate life and we celebrate recovery. And this happens all over the world on different weekends at different times. And it just happens to be happening in Hayes, Kansas this weekend. And there's probably some others going on throughout the world. She goes, oh. So she looks at me and she goes, God sent you here. So I didn't know whether to listen or it's not easy and towards the door. So she says, my son's 26 years old and he, and he drinks and he stops and he goes, goes for 10 days and then he goes on these binges and his life's just crazy and it's, it's just, oh, he says, I feel so bad for him, I just want to help him. And I said, well, when he stops for those 10, 20 days, when he stops, does he do it alone? Does he do it with somebody? Does he do it with counseling? Does he do it with anything? He says, no, he does it by himself. I said, well, I found that when I try to do that by myself, it just doesn't work. I said, I tried that for a lot of years and it just didn't work. I said, it wasn't until I reached out to other people like me that it worked. And that's what I found in Narcotics Anonymous. So now she's just like staring at me and, you know, a little. She goes, well, actually, I was hooked on pain meds for five years and I've been thinking of taking some. He says, and I don't want them because I wasn't supposed to be on them for five years. I was just, you know, going to different doctors and saying, wow. And now she's telling me about her sister-in-law and, and her daughter. And, and every once in a while she goes, I can't believe I'm telling you this. And I says, well, maybe you're supposed to. And then she'd say, God sent you here, you know. I says, I think he did. So a little time went on. She says, well, actually, I've been drinking a lot of wine with my meals lately. I said, oh, well, you know, it depends how much you have. If you, you know, and I, don't, I don't know whether you're an addict or an alcoholic. I'm not sure, you know. So now she just stops and she's looking at, well, actually, I've been drinking straight vodka. Because I don't want my husband to know. You know, you can't smell vodka. I said, well, that's kind of a myth, but I said, let me ask you something. I says, this is what happened to me. I got to that vodka stage, and I didn't want the family to know. I says, do you have the nips in one pocket and the mints in the other? She goes, how did you know? I says, because I've been there before. And I, it was the same thing. I says, I wanted to hide it from people. I can't let my husband know. I says, well, what happened to me is whether people saw me taking the substance or staggering or whatever, even if I walk the straight line, my personality changes. That's why people, I says, is anybody noticing your personality? People been mentioning, what's wrong with me? There's something different. I says, well, that's what starts to happen because we can't hide that. So I, so now another customer came into the, into the uh, store and I went into the other room and she's telling the lady to spiel about the sales. So now she comes from behind the counter. And this woman was in her late 60s, you know, and so it doesn't matter how old we are, you know, and we're not seeking help, we're not seeking help. And she came from behind the counter, and she worked in the other room, and she's looking at me, and she goes, I can't believe you're here, and I can't believe, I've never told anybody any of this. I says, well, I'm not going to tell anybody either. I said, and I gave her my phone number. I says, listen, if you ever need to talk, or you want to, I says, you know, I'm sure they have, they have helplines here. You might want to go to a meeting, you know, just to check it out. So she says, you know, I try to get my son to go to a meeting, so he wouldn't want to go. I says, well, maybe you can just go. And if you get better, maybe he'll get better. Because that's how it happens sometimes. And I'm looking at her and I says, 
you look like you need a hug. I gave her a hug. She wouldn't let go of me. She says, no one's ever said this to me. No one's ever talked to me about this. I've been holding this in for so long. And she wouldn't let go of me. So I stepped back and I said, listen, you call me. If you ever need to talk about this or you want to get hooked up, please call me. And I says, you know, I need to get back. And I says, but I'll gladly come back here again or whatever. And so I'm going to leave. She goes, could you give me another hug? <laughs> so I gave her another hug. And I walked out of the store and I'm walking back to the, the hotel. And I'm crying. And the whole way back, I just kept saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Because I know that I was asked to come out to that convention. But I truly believe the real reason I was there was to walk into that shop and give that addict, that I believe is an addict, some hope. Because we never know when you're going to touch somebody's life. You know, you just never know. So I used to say the program wasn't working for me. It ain't going to work for me. And the reason it wasn't working for me because I wasn't practicing the program. I was practicing the fellowship. I like to go to meetings, I like to go to dances, I like to go to conventions, but I didn't want to do the program, which is the 12 steps and 12 traditions and 12 concepts. I didn't want to do that. So it wasn't until then that it started working. So if you're sitting there and you're kind of saying, this isn't working for me, I'm having a hard time, this program won't work for me, I would suggest go to the 12 steps, it's going to take you a while, Go to the 12 steps, and at the end of the 12 steps, you say, okay, this doesn't work for me. But it's hard to say something doesn't work if you haven't been through it. <laughs> Last year in March, I got laid off. I came home. My wife says I want a divorce. It wasn't good timing. In October, my mom died. I was able to be there nine days in the hospital while she was in a coma before she died. It was a spiritual experience. I didn't want to use to any of those experiences. I've never heard anybody in a meeting raise their hand and say, my wife wanted to get a divorce I used and now she wants me back. I just got laid off, I shot some dope, and hey, they hired me back. <laughs> My mom died, I used, hey, she's alive again. <laughs> I'm not making light of that, it's just using doesn't make anything better. I don't need to be unemployed, going to a divorce, my mom dying, and be using. And the reason I know that is because you told me that. I listened to your experiences. Last year, I, at 55, I just changed careers. I wanted to do something different. I got into real estate. What a fucking mistake that was. <laughs> now, I joke. It just makes me work a little harder because the way the market is. But what are you going to do? But I've heard people go back to college. I heard people go get jobs they wanted to do. I don't want to say, what if, what if, what if. Let me give it a shot. Let me take the risk. Let me do that. So it just makes me work a little harder. I had to move out of the house. I had a house looking at the ocean. I now live in a two-room, two-and-a-half-room basement apartment. I drive a 1990 Toyota. I work in commission. I've only sold one house in three months. And I am happy. And when I was going through all that stuff last year, people say, how you doing? I said, I'm doing okay, I'm just not feeling okay. Right. And they'd say, what? I say, I'm doing okay, I'm just not feeling okay. There's sometimes when I'm feeling okay and I'm doing okay. I said, but you know, as long as I'm clean, I'm a member of Narcotics Anonymous, I'm still alive, I'm doing okay. Yeah.
Some of the early recovery told me when you get a mountain to climb, stop looking at the mountain. When I have a lot of stuff, because when I got clean, oh my God, I got caught, I got this, I got this, I'm homeless, oh, oh, oh. And I thought I wanted to try to, you know, solve everything at once. And someone said, concentrate, concentrate on the path. Put one foot in front of the other. Start walking down the path. Put your priorities in, in, in focus and then just get there. Before you know it, you'll be on the mountain and on the way down. Well, last year when the mountain was building, I had to stop looking at all that stuff and just concentrate on the path in front of me, get my priorities, and just keep marching. And then I'm on the way back down the mountain. And that's what I do today because anything worked early always works through recovery. And I'll end with this. Usually when people say that, they go on for another half hour. <laughs> my niece gave me a card because just as the disease of addiction affects my family, so does recovery. And she gave me this card and then it said, may peace with the past and faith in the future gently guide you through today. And that's what I need, I need peace with the past. I need faith in the future and I wanna be gently guided through today. And I keep those in perspective, they work. And uh, don't give up on yourself, peace. Yeah.